Well, I think I found a new perfect vlogging lens for the GH5. I mean, it really just takes vlogging to a whole nother level. I mean, look at these shots. Just perfect. Let's get undone. What is happening, everybody? I'm Gerald Undone, and because I've been neglecting all my lovely Micro Four Thirds fans for a little while now because of all this Nikon talk, I figured it's the perfect time to take a look at the new 56mm f1.4 lens from Sigma. First, though, I've got to give a quick shout out to Camera Canada for providing me with this lens. Camera Canada is definitely my go-to store for lens shopping, and it's where I get all my Sigma glass. So if you're looking to get your mitts on this nifty little Sigma, make sure you check out their links in the description below. All right, so let's open up this box and take a look at the lens. So my first impressions of the lens are that it's tiny. I was expecting it to be bigger because the other Sigma contemporary lens that I have is quite a bit bigger. Right now, I'm using the Sigma 16mm f1.4, which quickly became my favorite GH5 lens and I use it pretty much every day, but it's, I would say, double the size of this lens. The second thing you'll notice right away when you pop it on your camera is how tight the angle of view is. Because this is a 56 millimeter, that's gonna be 112 millimeter equivalent for full frame, which means you're gonna have a 28.5 degree angle of view. Now, when it came to creating some tests for this lens, I wanted to choose things that would be logical and practical based on the inherent strengths and weaknesses of this focal length. So as I joked about in the beginning of this video, this is not a vlogging lens by any stretch of the imagination. And because the reproduction ratio is only one to 7.4, it's not really gonna be suitable for any kind of macro work either. And the lens isn't stabilized, but I actually did some hand held pans and tilts with it and I was pretty impressed with the results I would say I was expecting it to be much worse now a lot of this is probably due to the stabilization on the G9 but I do think that the design and the weight distribution has something to do with that. It's actually pretty well balanced. But anyway, the test that I thought that would be more practical for a lens like this would be checking out the sharpness and focus performance when taking tight portraits, because I think that's probably the number one intended use for this lens. And with that, we'll take a look at the Bokeh, because this is essentially the contemporary version of Sigma's Bokeh Master. And then with video, we'll set it up as sort of a tight, B cam, second angle for closer coverage and check out its focusing capabilities and clarity. I'm not gonna bother with any side-by-side -side comparisons because there really isn't another lens similar enough to this one to test it against. So let's just look at it for what it is and see if it's worth the price. The price, by the way, is pretty compelling at $480 US or $620 Canadian. All right, so let's look at some portraits. So first up, when it comes to focusing, testing it on the G9, it focuses as quickly as you would need it to for a portrait scenario. It didn't struggle at all for me and I was pleased with the results. I tested in a few different scenarios and each time the focus was sharp and accurate, which I guess you should expect from a contrast detection based system. The lens produced a nice clean image with terrific sharpness as you can see here. Focusing on the eye worked well and I'm really pleased with the outcome. If we jump in over here at the lights in the background, we can take a look at the bokeh. Now this is pretty subjective because everybody might like something different, but obviously I would assume that you're going for some kind of level of bokeh balls if you're gonna buy a lens with this focal length and aperture. But uh, for me, I thought the result was decent. There's a minimal amount of onion ringing. The shape is a little bit oblong, but not too bothersome. And when we put it together with the overall composition, I think that the result is quite pleasing. I've also got some test shots here to check the corners and also check for aberration. I use the Sony logo here because whenever I take photos of it, it always seems to have some kind of color fringing. So if we take a look here and turn off the lens corrections, you can see that there is definitely some green with a little bit of yellow action going on here. That was relatively easy to fix. I only had to bump up the amount to about five and then shift the green hue down a little bit more to the yellow and it came off, but there is a little bit of that fringing, but that level of fringing on lenses like this seems to happen pretty regularly, so. You know, take that to mean what you want. It's easy to fix, but there is a little bit there. Once again, this is what it looked like with it off. And then I also have some images of a grid layout here 
which again, if we have lens corrections off, this will help us look a little bit at the, sh uh, the corner sharpness as well. But if we take a look down in these bottom corners, let me zoom in a little bit, you're gonna see a little bit of that purple blue action happening. And then if we take a look at the top here, we can also see it here. But again, this came away pretty easily with just uh, lens corrections. All I had to do is uh, drop the D fringe up to three on the purple and I didn't even have to adjust the positions of the hue. Now while we're in here, let's just take a look at the sharpness across the frame, which is quite good actually. So this is gonna be the bottom left hand corner. We're losing a little bit, there's a little bit of a droop off here towards the left, but it's not too bad and again on the right, but if, if we look at it maybe just a little bit zoomed out, we can see that overall the sharpness is maintained pretty well right across the frame. One more image to look at the corners with. This is a zoomed out, we have a grid, so we would see if there was any you know, warping in the corners or any lack of sharpness. And if we go to sort of more of a midfield kind of thing, this is the sharpness that you would expect right in the center, right at the focus point. So you can see it gets just a hair less sharp, but it's not its not a big deal. And even all the way down into the corner, it maintains sharpness corner to corner really well. I mean, you look at the image collectively, there doesn't seem to be a weak spot unless you really pixel peep. That's a great aspect about this lens. All right, so for this next test, we're gonna take a look at it as a bit of a, you know, B cam for a tighter coverage kind of angle. So I've got it set up over here. I would say it's about five or six feet away and probably at about a 35 to 40 degree angle off from the A cam here. and. <laughs> Right away you're gonna notice that it is extremely tight. And this is kind of a recurring thread, obviously, of this video, is that <laughs> the focal length is really tight. Now, in here, I'm, I'm using it in a small studio, so this is something to consider if you have a similar situation. It's just not workable in this size of space. Now, there's nothing wrong with it, and, and I'm running on face detection right now, too. So we can use this as a bit of an autofocus test to see, you know, how the face detection is performing. And it looks like, based on the screen, that it's doing okay, but we'll see, obviously, when we load it up. So it performs well and it does what it's supposed to do. It's just, is this what you want it to do? So that's a consideration obviously that you're gonna have to make. It's a lot closer. <laughs> the 16 millimeter lens that I'm using on the GH5 right now is just over an arm length away. This one's beyond two arm lengths away and it looks like this. I also did some autofocus tests. I have them in photo mode and in video mode. In photo mode, I just put it on AF single and jump back and forth between two targets and saw how quickly and reliably it focused. And then for video, I put it on AFC with sort of a, a, a wider box and just saw how it transitioned. And I also gave it some pop-in tests and some tracking tests. of a summary, do I like the lens? Well, in terms of its performance and its sharpness, the answer is yes. I think it focuses quite nicely. I like the build and construction of it. It's balanced well. And I think even for smaller cameras, smaller ones in the G9, I think you'll still be able to maintain quite a decent balance. And when it comes to the sharpness of the image, I think it's great. Corner to corner looks good. I was pleased with the results. I like the bokeh. I, I, think, it's, I think it's great for what it does. But if the question was, do I like the lens from a practical standpoint, or rather, do I like the focal length? The answer is no. I don't really find it that useful for video for the reasons that I already mentioned. I think that if I wanted that tighter coverage, I would opt instead for a telephoto zoom and just trade off having a smaller aperture. And when it comes to portraits, the thing that I think it's intended for, for me personally, I actually prefer more like the 85 millimeter focal length, so that'd be 42 and a half on micro four thirds. That's a field of view that I'm a bit more comfortable with when it comes to portraits. And with that, even though the price is quite compelling on the Sigma, I think that there's better options for the money. You've got the uh, Panasonic Lumix 42.5 millimeter lens here. That's an F1.7, so sure, it's a little bit slower, but it's a little bit cheaper as well, and it has image stabilization. Now, when I compare those two lenses, I do have to give a little bit of credit to the Sigma because the build quality is quite nice, and I would say maybe better than that 42.5 f1.7. And it's also weather sealed, uh, which is kind of surprising because a lot of Sigma lenses aren't weather sealed, but this these contemporary ones are. It's weather sealed reasonably well. And uh, I just think, you know, you're, you're getting, for that little bit extra money that it costs over the Panasonic, you can feel it when you hold it. You can feel the extra money in your hand. But again, I find the field of view 
on that Panasonic to be a little bit more practical. So for me, I would rather save the money and get that. And if the money wasn't so much of an issue, there are two other lenses that are kind of like a best of both worlds scenario, and that's the Panasonic Leica 42.5, which is an f1.2, and Olympus also has a 1.2. It's a 45 millimeter part of their Pro line, and these lenses are excellent, like just amazing lenses, probably some of the best, if not the best, on the Micro Four Thirds system, but they cost like two to three times more than these lenses. So for the money though, you're actually getting a pretty good value with the Sigma when you compare it to those more expensive models, if you can find a use for the focal length. But sadly for me, I could not. Now there is an exception to everything I just said though, and that's if you're buying this lens for Sony. If you guys didn't know, these contemporary lenses from Sigma, like the 16 millimeter and 30 millimeter, they also come out for Sony and are intended for their crop cameras. And on those cameras, the focal length is a lot closer to that 85 millimeter comfort zone that I'm in because of the 1.5 times crop on Sony, the 56 millimeter is about an 84 millimeter equivalent. So a lens like this with that performance and that sharpness at that price tag and being in that 85 millimeter wheelhouse that I like so much, I would say that's a terrific purchase for a Sony Alpha shooter. But rather than theorize about this stuff, my YouTuber friend Dunna from his channel Dunna Did It also picked up one of these lenses for his Sony A6500. So I'll let him tell you about it. Hey Gerald, thanks for having me on. I've got the 56 millimeter here on my trusty A6500 and I'm really happy with it. I've been really impressed with the quality of this lens, like straight out of the box. I took a couple of photos just of like some people at work and was just right away blown away with not only the sharpness of it, but also the autofocus and the bokeh in the background. My big question for the 56 millimeter is whether it would stand up to the Conquer 30 millimeter, which previously was named the sharpest lens that you could buy for the Sony E-mount APS-C system. And from my tests, I'm pretty sure that this thing is actually sharper than that. The other thing that I wanted to test it out against was the Sony 50 millimeter. And again, this thing just blows it out of the water. The only downside that I had to it is very similar to what you're talking about. I'm not used to shooting on something that's this zoomed in. I typically shoot on either my 16 millimeter or my 30 millimeter, and I even shoot most of my portraits on 30 millimeter. So going to a 56, which is an 84 millimeter equivalent, it's really zoomed in and in my tiny studio at work and in my small space at home here, the 56 is really tight. Now that being said, I do think it's more about getting used to the focal length than it is to it not being good. A lot of people swear by that 85 millimeter focal length. I know you love it. And the more that I use this, the more I really have been loving it. I did some shots with my wife at one of our favorite spots and they turned out fantastic. And that was like trying to deal with the Sony app and everything like that. And they're just still sharp as a tack. Just a really fantastic lens for Sony. Highly recommended by me for sure. I'll send it back to you. Thanks again. So I think that just about does it for the things that I wanted to talk about when it comes to this lens. But I also want to thank Dunna for providing his perspective on the Sony. I'll put links to his channel in the description and at the end of this video. I highly recommend that you check him out. He makes high quality content. He's a pleasure to listen to and he's just generally a nice guy. Overall, I think it's a great lens. I just think that it's kind of a niche focal length on micro four thirds. But I know there's lots of you out there that like shooting portraits at this focal length. And I'm sure there's others still for whom this lens would fill a rather specific need brilliant that I didn't even consider and at a fantastic price point. Niche products are hard to review because they're not for everybody and it's not a lens where you can easily just say, everyone's gotta buy this. But that doesn't make the lens any less good. And the best part about niche products is that when they finally do find their perfect application, they tend to perform better than anything else possibly could. But that's gonna be it for me. I hope you found this video helpful or at least entertaining. And if you did, make sure you leave it the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, feel free to hit the dislike button twice. All right, I'm done.